Welcome to the Ghostly Gallery podcast, a place where we explore the world of horror in film, television, books, and in popular culture. Well, greetings, everyone. Welcome to the program. My name is Bruce Markison. As always, I am joined by producer and co-host Tracy Asteria. So, Tracy, what's going on with you? Well, I've got a new addition to my collection. I typically don't collect Funko Pops, but um, this was a special case. Stargate, the movie from Dean Devlin, actually released collectors Funko Pops, including Jack O'Neill, Anubis, Daniel, the Horus Guard, and Ra. So I have the whole collection, and I'm very, very happy. So Interesting. So they're like uh, miniature statuettes. They are. They're just made out of plastic, yeah. but... Um, they're kind of fancy. This one, it's um, Jack O'Neill with two L's. And unfortunately, it's kind of a bit of a typo because O'Neill with two L's actually belongs to the TV series. Who has a sense of humor? But O'Neill with one L, which is what this should be, actually belongs to the movie. So, oh, okay. Yeah. And those are done in kind of a cartoonish way, right? They are. They're actually, yeah. they're really kind of cute. Um, some of them are metallic in color, which is, which is really special too. So it's, I think it's been a really long time since they've released any Stargate merchandise. So yeah. this was a special treat. Very nice. You know, it's funny you mentioned that because recently I saw at the Hall of Fame where I work here in Cooperstown, I went into a coworker's office and he had set up these special shelves on the walls in his office, and they are completely filled with those Funko Pop statuettes from Star Trek. Every imaginable one. There must have been over a hundred. Oh my gosh! Oh wow! Yeah, every. You've got you've got some pretty diehard collectors out in that market. I'm not a diehard collector, but um, yeah, they're they're pretty cute. Yeah. yeah, it's become a big thing to collect. No question about it. Very good. Mm -hmm. Well, on this week's show, we will not be um, interviewing a, a Funko Pop figurine, but actually a real person. Our guest this week is horror enthusiast Dave Pluffet. Uh, Dave is a lecturer at Cal State Fullerton, also a co-host of multiple programs on the YouTube channel, The Late Late Horror Show, and as a regular listener of the Ghostly Gallery podcast, we like to reward our loyal listeners by having them on from time to time. Dave, very much an expert in the genre of horror, as well as in the field of the paranormal. Dave, thank you very much for joining us. Welcome to the Ghostly Gallery. How are you doing? I am fantastic. It is a pleasure to be on your program, Bruce and Tracy. And I have listened to each and every one of the past 55 episodes. Yay. Wow. I'm so great. excited to have you, Dave. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. I'm so excited to talk horror. You may be the only one who's listened to all 55. I don't think I've listened to all 55. I mean, I, we've recorded 55, but I don't always go back and listen to them and, and, you know, study them the way that you do. So we really appreciate that. Absolutely. So, Dave, as we begin our little talk here, I wanted to ask you about exactly when you developed an interest in the horror genre. Is this something from your youth? Did it come later on? Tell us about exactly when it happened. It is something that has evolved throughout my life. And growing up in the 80s, our horror host here in Los Angeles was Elvira. And so every weekend, I looked forward to seeing Elvira and being introduced to the hammer horror genre. I was way too young to be understanding a lot of the hammer horror, but I love Peter Cushing because of course he played in Star Wars, so a recognizable figure in many of those films. But it was probably as I got into high school, I got introduced to Joe Bob Briggs the first time around when he was doing his cable show in college, I had a, a wonderful class on the horror novel, and I took it as one of my English electives. 
And that really opened the floodgate into so much horror, uh, including, uh, this is where I met Robert Block, obviously not in person, but uh, should say introduced to him, as well as H.P. Lovecraft, who I'm still a, an avid follower and listener and enthusiast to his work. And then, of course, throughout my 20s and 30s, uh, I listened to, late, listened to the late Art Bell. Let's talk a little bit about Elvira. I've only seen a few of her hosting efforts. They occasionally show them on the network Comet, which airs a lot of horror and sci-fi. Uh, so I'm certainly, you know, not as in tuned. I mean, I know about her. She's very famous, but I haven't seen a lot of her shows. What is it you like about Elvira and her, her style of uh, sort of uh, parodying uh, the movies that she presents? Well, in a way, she was very similar to how Joe Bob Briggs was, where he would bring you into the film, give you a little bit of background, cut in at the commercial breaks, taking you in and out of breaks, and then, of course, wrapping up the movie. Uh, extremely funny. And, of course, you know, being an early teenager, very much a seductress laying on the, on the couch and very much in a vampire type of outfit. And it was, especially in Los Angeles, um, you couldn't go a weekend without watching one of the programs. And of course, everyone would be talking about it on school on, you know, on Monday. So it was just kind of like a must see over the weekend. Uh, have you ever had a chance to meet Elvira being like out in LA? I have not. She is very, very active on Instagram. And mm -hmm. I'm sorry, it, Instagram and possibly Twitter as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I catch up with her on Instagram. She does a lot of uh, fan interaction still. And I did have maybe a one degree separation from her. One of my friends worked in a store in Beverly Hills and ended up having lunch with her at a mall one day. Just happened to sit down. And, and of course, she was not dressed up. It was Cassandra right. Peterson and got to introduce her and uh and be introduced to her. And he had always said she was just such a, a lovely person. So. Oh, wow. Oh, that's so cool. You know, I remember there was this rivalry between her and Vampira, who was played by Mela Nurma. And Mela Nurma actually took her to court saying that Elvira had kind of stolen her appearance and maybe stolen her act. Uh, I know there aren't a lot of tapes of Vampira that are around, uh, so I, I don't know that much about like her audio presentation. But as far as the the physical look of the two, very much the same. Mm -hmm. Definitely, yeah. But uh, what I found too with Elvira is she ended up being on so many television shows right around Halloween. I always remember the. Chips episode where you see Elvira running across the street in high heels. And it was like a major street like La Cienega down in Los Angeles. And, you know, it. she was a very popular local celebrity. Well, we have um, Knott's Berry Farm near here. And yep. during yep. October, it changes to Knott's Scary Farm. <laughs> and for many, many years, uh, she was the host of that, where you would, you know, pay your tickets and, and go and, and get to hang out and try to find her at the park. So she really made a lot of her character. I've been to Knott's Berry Farm. This was like way back in the late 70s. I didn't know about the Knott's Scary Farm in October. Have you ever been to that? I have. And it is it is quite the event. It is probably not an event for children. It is something where creatures will come out at you. They will have uh, small like skates on their knees. So they will run mm -hmm. at you and then jump to the ground and kind of slide right up to you. Uh, you can go through a lot of the mazes and characters will reach out and try to grab you. And it's, it's a very physical type of uh, interactive haunted house type of fun. Yeah. The other host that you mention is my personal favorite. Uh, I've met him in person at several conventions. A really nice guy, although very different off air than when he's on screen, on camera. 
and that's Joe Bob Briggs. I love his sense of humor, but also how in-depth he goes on the films. You can tell he does a lot of research, so passionate about it. Yeah, growing up in the 80s, this is probably very late 80s and early 90s is when I was introduced to Joe Bob Briggs, and I did not have cable at the time. Mm -hmm. But one of my coworkers taped the shows for me. And so he every month or so, he would bring me a video cassette full of Joe Bob Briggs shows. And that's where I got introduced to series like Puppet Master and Basket Case, one, two, and three. Uh, of course, Frankenhooker, the, that famous film, uh, was shown on yeah, that. And right. I loved how he would come out of his trailer and th it, he'd always knock over an empty bottle of beer and he'd sit down and he'd, he'd count up. You know, it, he would do that. You know, we have, um, was it Blood, Breasts, and Beasts? He would do that countdown at the beginning <laughs> of every show. And I remember there was one movie that he showed with Anthony Perkins and he added a monkey mutilation to the very end of that. And we're going to have one monkey mutilation. Wow. That's great. <laughs> Let's talk about some of your absolute favorite movies growing up in the 1980s. If there's two or three that are really at the top of the list, what would they be? Well, surprisingly, the top of the list is actually going to be Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho from the 1960s or maybe 59 to 60. Uh, that is my all-time favorite movie. It's a comfort movie. It is uh, a movie I've shown to my class. And even though I teach in the arts, we do a lot of visual identification and, and breaking down of, um, of the visual. So I show them Psycho. And I am so surprised very few, like one person out of 100 has seen the movie. And hmm. by the time that they're done, they absolutely love the film. And then they go in search of Psycho 2, 3, and 4, which I tell them probably not the best thing to do. <laughs> because they're totally different films in that series. Mm -hmm. I wish they had actually stuck with the book. Uh, Psycho 2, the book, is much different than Psycho 2, the movie. Although they do take place at the exact same time, roughly about 22 years after the end of Psycho. Mm -hmm. And I would even mention that Psycho 2 is probably even better than the original Psycho. Um, the third book that Robert Block wrote was called Psycho House. And I personally did not care for that. But when you look at the trilogy that he wrote, it was really kind of fascinating to take a look at it because in Psycho, the original movie, it's the other person that is crazy. But in Psycho 2, you happen to be the one that's crazy. And in Psycho House, it's society that's crazy. So he mm -hmm. brings in a he weaves in a really interesting theme to his to his books. And of course, in, in the Psycho 2, 3, and 4 are much more for the, you know, the teenage audience, you know, the uh, very similar to like a Friday the 13th type of film. Yeah. Right. You know, I agree with you. Psycho 2 is one of those great films that I think a lot of diehard fans of the genre really appreciate it. But then if you get outside of the genre, the, out of the outside of the diehards, a lot of people don't realize just how good it is. It's really fantastic. And of course, the original from 1960 is, is an absolute classic. It's a five star film. You know, you talk about the pantheon of horror movies. Psycho has got to be in there, one of the top four or five of all time. And I think the work that Anthony Perkins did as Norman Bates, even though it's recognized to this day, I, I still think a lot of people don't fully appreciate just how good he was in playing that role, especially in the first film. It is one of those roles that is is very fortunate, but it's also, I think, very unfortunate for the actor it's where no one else can play that role. And he's so typecast as that particular character. Now in the book, Psycho, uh, Norman Bates is not an attractive young man. He's not thin or anything like that. He's middle-aged, he's a little paunchy, he's bald. Um, but we have this really kind of almost debonair type of character in Psycho with this young Anthony Perkins right off of Broadway 
hasn't done anything major in terms of film. And he gets typecast as this character, not unlike uh, Basil Rathbone or Sherlock Holmes or uh, the Carl Kolchak character that, you know, I'm kind of involved with talking about now as a series. Um, it, it's just one of those things that it's very difficult to distinguish that person outside of that role. But I think it also shows you how great that person was as an actor. Oh my gosh, absolutely. Now I haven't read the books yet. Um, they're kind of like sitting, sitting on my list to read, but um, that's kind of a really good point because the novels do differ from the films. And I really did like, well, especially the first one, just absolutely loved it. Well, it was interesting as well that Psycho, the original novel, is almost word for word the exact same as the film. The only difference is that there is a first chapter to the book that you don't see in the film. That gives you a little bit more feedback as far as the character of Norman Bates, his interaction with his mother, and possibly the grotesqueness of this person's mind. But other than that, the only difference is really the, the figure it's himself and also the name of Marion Crane. Uh, she has a different name in the film. Okay. I, I think it, it, it's maybe as simple as Mary, um, but it's, it's, it's not Marion Crane. Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, that's really good to know. Um, Bruce and I, we, we just screened a film there not that long ago, Long Legs, who was, it, it was directed by Anthony Perkins' son, Oswald. Have you had a chance to see that yet, Dave? I have not. Oh, it's, it is a very, very good movie. And I actually had no idea that his son directed that film until Bruce mentioned that. Wow. Um, it's a very highly rated movie. Okay. So, yeah. You know, yeah. if you like Silence of the Lambs, you'll probably like Long Legs. Uh, and if you like Nicolas Cage, you'll definitely like it. It's great. I think it's one of the best of this year, frankly. Oh, terrific. I'm actually very much looking forward to Nosferatu coming out. Oh, yes, yes. And I, I did not see, and I know you reviewed it on an earlier podcast, but The Last Voyage of the Demeter. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I'm really looking forward to seeing, so. Yeah, that was actually a really good movie. It's a, it's another one I, I need to go back and kind of rewatch again. Um, Bruce really enjoyed that and. I thought it was really, it was beautifully shot, mm -hmm. but it was a little dark, like visually dark to sure. see. So it, it was good. Yeah, though. and it was a victim of circumstances too. You know, it came out last summer, 2023. And it when it first entered theaters, there were a couple of other movies, including Barbie, that were pretty much consuming everybody's attention. And it really got hurt at the box office. It didn't last in theaters long. And I don't think enough horror fans got to see it. It's it's excellent, really good. Okay, I'll look forward to seeing it. Yeah, and I think I read too that um, on October the 4th, I think that's actually the official release date of that new Salem Blot movie that's gonna be on um, HBO. So I'm looking forward to seeing that to see what they do with that too. You know, I, I do have a, a confession to make uh, out of as much as I love the horror genre and seeing these films, mm -hmm. I still have yet in your, in the poster in your background, uh, Tracy reminded me, uh, <laughs> I have yet to see the exorcist. Oh, really Dave? It is, <laughs> it is one of those presents that is yet to be unwrapped. Uh, I don't know if I told you, I, I did come across a copy of the book one time mm -hmm. and I picked it up for like a dollar. I'm not sure if it was at a, a yard sale or a friends of the library sale. And once I picked that book up, I started having all this bad luck <laughs> and I ended up selling it to a, a used bookshop. And once I did that, I, my luck got better. So uh, the book kind of almost was like a jinx for a little bit. So oh dear, I still put off that movie. Oh, the I, movie? I think we should end the interview right now, Tracy. I mean, he hasn't <laughs> seen the extras list. I mean, come on. That's it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that's that's my absolute favorite horror movie. Yeah. Um, but I have yet to read the book, The Exorcist. I haven't been able to, to find a copy. So that's kind of like another kind of on my wish list to to actually find. So because I heard that 
the novel was excellent. Oh, yeah. It's great. It's a fast read. There's a lot of action. It's it's more in-depth than the film, but at the same mm -hmm. time, you don't get bogged down into too many details. There's some really frightening and graphic scenes. Uh, it's a terrific. Uh, uh, William Peter Blatty did a great job writing that book, and you can see why they wanted to make it into a film. Um, and that's one of the few cases where you know, you have a great book and a masterpiece of a film that go together so well. That's right. And just like on the topic of like the, the Exorcist franchise with Mike Flanagan taking over the helm, um, that, that will be interesting. Actually, was that the Exorcist? Yes. Yeah, the Exorcist. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, he's gonna, he's, I believe it's going to come out 2026, if I'm not mistaken. That's right. So I'm kind of looking forward to see what he's going to do with the franchise. So, yeah. So I have a question for you, Dave. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> let's talk about a little bit of your work on the Late Late Horror Show. Um, it's a YouTube channel and you co-host shows with Dino. And they're just like a multitude of different subjects. So share with us some of the ones that you do. We uh, get together every Sunday evening, and uh, Dino and I have known each other for close to nine years now. He hosted a, an original program on, it was called, uh, uh, it was an Art Bell, Remembering Art Bell podcast, something along those lines. I don't remember right offhand. And it was something that Art Bell had been off the air for several years, and he was coming back onto Sirius XM Radio. And it was so exciting. And I found this guy who was going, that was talking about each and every one of his shows. And I was just entranced by it. And then I found out that he and his partner, Ted, um, would produce these basically breakdowns of films, mm -hmm. uh, film reviews. And this included like Salem's Lot and uh, all the great uh, universal horror films. And I, I was just intrigued by that. And then later on, uh, Art Bell, unfortunately, went off the air and they just started doing, they became the Little Monsters movie podcast. And then later on became the Late Late Horror Show. And I jumped on and started talking about uh, Kolchak, the Night Stalker. Mm -hmm. uh, we did the films and then the TV series. Uh, we're almost done with the TV series. We do about one of those shows a month. And we also deal with uh, just some fun things. There's two guys hanging out. Uh, we talk Columbo and the Wild Wild West. Uh, we've talked about uh, The Prisoner, uh, the 1969 series uh, from TV, and just a, a few random films like Clue or Murder by Death. Oh, wow. Okay. And you also do some of the Paranormal Into the Night episodes with Dino now. Do you talking about Art Bell? Yes. Yes. And thank you for bringing that up. It's uh, We do about one a month and mm -hmm. it is uh, very much uh, giving tribute to someone who was so Im important to our lives growing up in Los Angeles here. Art Bell would come on around 10 o'clock at night and he would go to three, four in the morning sometimes. And it was a live TV show back when there were very few commercials on the radio. And mm -hmm. so it was just him talking about everything from UFOs to ghosts to any, anything that may have been even topical at the time, for instance, uh, the OJ Simpson trial. But normally it was along those paranormal lines. And I remember the very first time I listened in, he was talking about the, the pyramid over, uh, or the eye in the uh, pyramid over the $1 on the back of the $1 bill. Right. And it was something that seemed so innocuous, but he was going on for at least an hour or two on that subject. And I'm like, oh, I sure hope he does the same thing tomorrow night. And I didn't realize at that time that's what he did every night. So it was very much a treat. Uh, I was on his program one time. Uh, I was on his very last program, and I'm about the fifth caller from the end. Mm. And I still one of the highlights of my life was saying that I could get to talk to him in person, and uh, I really enjoyed that. So 
Oh, nice. So what kinds of things, like, do you just kind of reminisce about some of the episodes when when you talk about him on the Late Late Horror Show? Well, we love talking about the Area 51 caller. Okay. Uh, we love talking about EVPs and, you know, voice recordings. Mm -hmm. um, we also do a, a series from his Ghost to Ghost programs. One of the things that we look forward to every single year uh, were the ghost to ghost right around Halloween. And if your Halloween landed on a weekend, like let's say it was a Saturday, he would do it both Friday and Saturday night. And so you kind of got a double dose of ghost stories for hours and hours and hours. And fortunately, many of them are still on YouTube that you can find. Okay. Uh, some of them are very, very scary. And um, others are, are kind of silly, but it's, you know, your only rule was there was no cussing and the story had to be true. And he would immediately, when you opened up, he would, uh, when he opened up the program, he would tell you to turn your lights out, listen to the radio. So it was very much reminiscent of, you know, back in the 1940s, even listening to radio late at night. Mm -hmm. And people would call up or he'd read faxes and, and things like that. And he just had a really great voice. And it was uh, some stories that I still take with me today that are great. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing those memories. I, I, I've I heard of Art Bell, but I'm, I haven't listened to a lot of his shows. But um, it's good to know that they're available on YouTube. I'll have to, you know take a deep dive, especially over the spooky season and uh, listen to some of those. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, he had some episodes that dealt with Egypt and he got to travel a lot. Uh, his wife, uh, last wife uh, was from the Philippines and, and he would transmit from there on occasion. But overall, it was uh, really just a, a fun experience and a fun person to listen to on the radio. Unfortunately, the bad side is he did retire probably at least three times during during his reign. And so he may have been off the air for six months or so, but then he had this overwhelming need to come back and say, yeah, I'm still going to do it. Or he might come back for the weekends and, and do weekend shows. So it was very unsteady. Once you got through about 2000 to 2005 the glory years were probably 95 to 2000 oh nice all right oh thank you we're going to get back to the paranormal in just a moment but i wanted to go back to something you just talked about you do one of your programs about kolchak the night stalker and i love that franchise the original movie was one of my favorites the night stalker the Night Strangler is maybe just as good, if not better. And then I remember watching that TV series when it came out in 1974. It was like every, I think, Friday night on ABC. And I avidly watched it, although I haven't seen the episodes in quite a long period of time. What is it about the TV show as opposed to the movies that you really like with that series? I... Well, say first, I think the movies are amazing. They are cult classics. They are, it, you know, we had talked about Psycho being my favorite film. I would tell you The Night Stalker is my second favorite film. Mm -hmm. And it is something that I watch every Halloween or it's something I want to watch uh, anytime I want to have that spooky feeling. And for the listeners who haven't seen the film, it's basically there's a vampire and the setting is Las Vegas in the <laughs> contemporary times of the 1970s. Loving to see as well what Las Vegas looked like back then. You know, when you have Caesar's Palace with a marquee up there and, and no, none of the high rise hotels and very little traffic on the strip. So it is very much um, nostalgic in that fact. And boy, I tell you that it, the story is, where you have this reporter is saying, Hey, there's a vampire here. And everyone else is saying, no, no, there isn't. And it's him following down this, this great, um, Oh my gosh. I can't remember the actor's name now. Barry. Oh, Barry Atwater. Barry Atwater. Thank you. 
Yeah. Uh, and Barry Atwater was actually a, a very common character actor, and he doesn't even have a word uh, in this movie. All he does is hiss, but he's a, a very scary uh, persona. In fact, I, I always think of him back in uh, the Twilight Zone, uh, the monsters on Maple Street. Uh, he mm. is in that episode as well. Yeah, that's right. The The second film, as you mentioned, is just as good as the first. And I, I think it's really an extension of the first. You have the great actors of, of film. You have Carradine, you have Grandpa Munster, you have the Wicked Witch of the West, all co-starring in various roles. Uh, Joanne Flug is the college student slash love interest of Carl Kolchak. And she makes a wonderful partner to go around Seattle with. Uh, since he did get kicked out of Las Vegas at the end of the film, he did go to Seattle. And unfortunately, he's going to get kicked out of Seattle as well at the end of that film. Um, it is shot at the very ending scene of the second film is at the Bradbury building here in Los Angeles. I did go and, and hang out there. Uh, it is a, a beautiful building. It was also, of course, uh, famous, famously in Blade Runner. But it is a building that was built in the late 1800s. And I actually wrote about this when I was in college because the building is a modernist masterpiece. And when they first built the building, it actually had to be built on these gigantic I-beams because the water level in Los Angeles in the late 1800s was so high that there wasn't a good enough dry area to build the foundation. So they actually had to build it around these I-beams because literally it's on um, Broadway and Spring Street. And it was not like spring the, the season. It is spring because there's natural water springs. So oh, wow. then they, they build this building, glass roof. So it's all, you know, open. Basically, it's an atrium. And this incredible cast iron work on each of the floors and the and the elevators and that was the home of the uh, the evil person in that film oh that's so cool what Played about the tv Rick. series dave the tv series starts out fantastic it is some of the best one hour programs you could ask for however a lot of those scripts seem to be cut down from possibly future Kolchak movies. Mm. So you had an hour and a half movie being cut down to 60 minutes. And what I found is that a lot of the linking ideas from one plot or one uh, scene to the next may be lost. And so you can definitely see how it was truncated and edited poorly, but I understand because they had to get it within that 60 minute time frame. Yeah. What I found is uh, there are a couple stinker episodes mr ring comes immediately to mind but there have been some wonderful episodes and it does get a little campy but it's it's an awful lot of fun and i'm really glad i watched the series it is uh, I, I especially like the fourth one in the film which is a, an extension of the night strangler it's just called the vampire and it is mm -hmm. one of the victims of Yano scorsone uh, has come to life and uh, she is wrecking havoc here in Los Angeles. You know, it's been so long since I've seen the, seen the TV series. I don't remember where it took place. He did do some traveling throughout. Uh, it is centered in Chicago, uh, but he yeah. does take a cruise. Uh, he does visit Los Angeles. Uh, there's a couple college campuses as well that he goes to. Uh, in Illinois, so so real close to Chicago, but there are some uh, kind of like Cabot Cove uh, in the Murder, mm. She Wrote series. Uh, she is centered in Cabot Cove, but a lot of times she's visiting New York or where, wherever. And one last question on it. You know, Darren McGavin was so good in both the films and the television series. I've always heard and read that he got tired of doing the episodes. He was also like an executive producer it was just too much of a burden. And that was really the main reason why the show got canceled after one season. Is that true? Do you know? I have heard uh, various uh, 
issues. Uh, Mark Dewidziak brings them up. I, I know you've had him on as a guest before. Uh, mm -hmm. He's written uh, a great book on Kolchak, which I'm waiting for the reissue. Uh, I still don't think it has come out yet, but uh, he says that there was some issues on the set with some individuals and he was just kind of, of he was done and tired of it. Uh, yeah. I do wish it had gone on for a second season and I kind of argue that I wish it would have been kind of more of a monthly TV series like uh, Columbo was, where they had the the mystery wheel, where you would have Columbo the first Sunday of the month, Quincy, Rockford, or not Rockford Files, but, uh, oh, what was it? Macmillan and Wife. Macmillan and Wife, yes. Yeah, yeah. McLeod. McLeod was the other person. McLeod I was, was the other, right? The cowboy in New York City. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow do you know um for anybody that would be looking for the Kolchak movies or the tv series episodes do you know where those might be available at they're now available pretty much everywhere as far as the films go you can find them on youtube mm -hmm. they were just reissued on laserdisc so you're able to have a higher quality okay uh the tv series uh, i bought on dvd uh, although you can get them through Amazon Prime. Mm -hmm. And they're, I think, a little bit nicer actually on Amazon Prime. So um, they are available. And I'm glad more and more people are actually getting into it. Uh, they're, you know, it took me years and years after hearing about this great film, Kolchak, that I should go out and watch it. And I, you know, you always keep thinking Kojak with Telly Savalas, right? <laughs> and. <laughs> I'm like, why, why would I want to watch this TV, this, this film? And I was a big listener of the Lovecraft easing podcast when I was very much into, into HP Lovecraft. And they kept telling, mentioning this TV or this, uh, not only TV series, but mostly the movies and they're all, you've got to watch it. And it took me about probably five or six years to actually sit down and watch it. And it was one of those, things that I was immediately drawn into as soon as he started talking into his tape recorder. And it was something I'm like, why did I waste so much time not watching this film? And that also led me to kind of an undiscovered classic, which is the Norlis tapes, mm -hmm. uh, very similar in terms of format. It was on a competing uh, television station and it was a pilot for a series that did not get picked up uh very similar in format where the person finds some cassette tapes plays it because the person was missing and so his boss came to his apartment and pressed play and then you kind of watch the film uh angie dickinson is the uh, co-star of it and it kind of follows along the same pathway i also like it because weather plays such an important role as a character uh, very similar to Psycho. When you have Psycho and Marion Crane decides to steal the money and the further and further she gets away, she's hampered by the weather. And once she goes, okay, I'm going to return the money, the weather clears up. Here, the weather is just a constant rain in San Francisco area. Oh, interesting. I've not seen that. I'll have to uh, take a look for that as well. So it was just the one movie? It was just the one movie, and it was particularly a cult classic because it was not released on VHS. Okay. And so unless you watched it on TV, you could only, that was the only, you know, it became mythic in that way. And you can find it on YouTube, mm -hmm. and it's, it's, it's well worth the watch. And Claude Akins, who we have in the Kolchak movies, um, is also the sheriff in the Norlis tapes. That's a nice connection there. And also on the Twilight Zone, Monsters on Maple Street. Oh, cool. The Twilight Zone was an excellent series. Um, let's just chat about the paranormal just for a minute, Dave. Um, right. You had mentioned that you had an encounter with a ghost. And I remember we chatted about this before. And I would love if you could share your story with our listeners. I've had a couple. Oh, so wow. I, I have had 
one that is very, very scary. Um, and one that was not as scary, but kind of fun. Um, back in my early late teens and early twenties, I were, I, before I became a teacher, I worked selling plants for a living mm -hmm. and I worked both retail and wholesale. And this is during my time retail, I worked in this nursery that had been built in the, the 1920s and still in, you know, in business today, three suicides had taken place on the grounds of this nursery, including uh, two of the past owners. And when I was in a building uh, cutting paper, so I was kind of facing out a window using one of those big paper cutters and uh, cutting up cardboard boxes. I had backed up and stepped on someone's foot, uh, literally pressed against someone's chest uh, as, as you know, like someone had snuck up behind you and they were just too close when you backed up. And mm -hmm. I literally turned around and said, excuse me, I, you know, I thought it was my boss making sure I was doing my work correctly. And there was no one there. And I don't think I stopped running until I got to the front street because it scared me so bad at the moment. But it was a, a place where you would have doors and windows opening, you mm -hmm. know, it would it'd be kind of that type of uh, mystique. You would have uh, some shadows in the greenhouses. We had an electric cart that started to run by itself. Uh, luckily, there were no customers around. This was an uh, after hours thing. And we never, we always wanted to make sure the back warehouse was locked up before it got dark. So we just never wanted to, it was just, it was very, very dark back there. And one time it wasn't, it was uh, left open. And so myself, one other employee decided, well, we'll back, we'll walk back there together. And one of the other employees was just putting some things away back in the, uh, in the warehouse. And we didn't know he was in there and he comes out and just scare the heck out of us. We just turned and ran and it was, you know, a, a good thing to laugh about now, but it really scared us at the time. We were, un we, that was unexpected. Oh, geez. It, you know, just like those feelings of, you know, somebody standing behind you and doors opening and closing and equipment starting up on its own shadows, like that, that stuff can be very terrifying, especially in the right environment. And you just, it comes out of nowhere. So that's, uh, yeah, I've had a few experiences with creepiness and just terrifying paranormal activities. So, well, I I'm actually kind of jealous <laughs> about your part of the world. And in fact, both of you, since you're more on the East Coast than I am, out here, everything's pretty brand new. And if you have a building that's 100 years old, that's an ancient building as far as we're concerned. Uh, most of our buildings are, you know, from citrus groves that were bulldozed in the 1950s, you know, um, but, you know, back on the East Coast, and especially I'm sure up in Nova Scotia, where you are, Tracy, I mean, the buildings may be a couple hundred years old, or, you know, it's not far to go to a, find a building from the 1700s with great That's history. Right. Absolutely. It gets, um, well, Lewisburg up in Cape Breton, which is the fortress of Lewisburg is, uh, you know, in the daytime, it's not bad, but at night, it is the creepiest place I have ever been in. Just the um, high level of paranormal activity is, it's phenomenal. It's exciting, and, but terrifying at the exact same time. Yeah. So you also mentioned that you're a believer in UFOs, and you have had an encounter with a UFO? I had actually maybe let's call it two encounters with the UFO. And one of them stems from when I was a very, very young kid. It was just probably early 1970s. And I just remember the room in the house I was in that was my room. And it became my sister's room in 77, 78. So I was under seven years old. And I looked out one of the high windows and literally from down the street, which is where my grade school was, mm -hmm. uh, I saw this kind of UFO circular object, you know, just rising straight up from the ground. And it was like, am I really seeing this? You know, and, and it was something that has always stuck with me. 
uh, I would swear on a Bible that, you know, absolutely I saw this. And when I went to school the next day, uh, when I went out to the area that would have been even with my house, mm-hmm. out on the green, you know, playground, there was this black circle. And it was about maybe three, four inches in diameter all the way around. And it was probably 15 to 20 feet diameter. And it was something that this happened type of me. It just really um, brought home that what I did see was real. Oh, wow. But that was that was kind of the minor UFO incident that I had. And I, I would say that if you're familiar with Bob Lazar and his uh, tester model, mm-hmm. which he called the sport model, when he talked about his time in S4 and Area 51, it was very similar to that little type of glass globe on top and lights around the perimeter and such. But the one that scared me uh, the most and the one that really uh, was so different than anything else I've ever heard about UFOs is um, it was probably, again, late 70s playing in the backyard and my dad working on one side of the yard and I was swinging on the swing set on the other. And I started to hear this noise and it was, uh, it, it was a metallic noise. It was, you know, like a high radio frequency and it was coming from the left-hand side of me uh, over my neighbor's yard. And I saw this smaller metallic object. Uh, if you can think of maybe two paper plates together, but fully metal, um, Hmm. maybe about a foot and a half in diameter and probably about, again, maybe three to four inches thick uh, between the top and the bottom. But it was not traveling circular like you would think of as a normal UFO, Mm -hmm. but it was toppling end over end. And so it was kind of like how you would uh, flick a quarter up into the air. It was that type of a traveling motion. And it was traveling in a perfectly straight line uh, across my neighbor's house. I saw it cross my backyard into the neighbor's backyard. And what it scared me as I'm swinging on the swing is it was traveling kind of right near my father as Mm -hmm. he was working in the yard. And I was yelling out to him to look up, to, to see this thing. And my voice had been kind of like was absorbed into that sound. It was like just taken out. And it was, um, you know, I had to stop the swing and run over to my dad. Dad, did you see that? As I could see it just going into like three or four neighbors backyards, uh, to the East. And Mm -hmm. it's like, Oh, you know, I'm like, I, and I never heard of anyone else with a, a similar story to that or, that type of a shaped object. So that's something again, from my childhood that has kind of made me interested in this field of, of paranormal and UFOs and, and to keep an open mind about that type of subject. Right. What did your parents say? Like, did your dad say he saw or did, did he believe your story? I don't, he didn't disbelieve it, but it was something that with my, my parents, they've never said really anything. My dad did not see it. By the time I'm like, look at this, it was gone. Um, and this is, of course, well before the time of cell phones where we could have just taken a picture and like, look at this. But my parents were not necessarily believers, nor did they really talk about this type of subject. Oh, interesting. Okay. My parents probably wouldn't believe either. So. You know, I'm jealous of guys like you, Dave. You've had these experiences with UFOs. The closest I've ever had was watching a Brady Bunch episode when the three brothers thought they saw a UFO outside their bedroom and it turned out to be a practical joke. That was That's the closest I've gotten. Wasn't that a great episode, though? It was. I, the, uh, I think they played a slide recorder to do the music. Yeah. For the sound of the UFO. It's funny. Whenever I hear the word UFO, I always think of that episode. It's crazy how the mind works. <laughs> really weird. Now, Tracy tells me that you've lived in California for quite a time. Yes. And you've had some opportunities to visit some really iconic place or places featured in big name films. Tell us about some of these places you've had a chance to visit. 
this is one of the fortunate things of living in California. And there are some wonderful locations that you can visit. Uh, I'm about an hour away from South Pasadena. Mm -hmm. And that is where the Michael Myers house is. Uh, it is actually a house that's been moved. Uh, so you can go to two locations in South Pasadena, for instance, uh, in the original Halloween movie, which uh, my mom let me watch back in the late 70s. I don't know why she did that. Uh, <laughs> I think she could get in trouble for that today. But it was uh, a movie I absolutely loved with, uh, of course, a uh, very young Jamie Lee Curtis. And she's sitting on the corner with a pumpkin in her lap. And you can go and visit that corner today. Uh, hmm. The Michael Myers house uh, is not that far away. It's, I believe, off Mission in Fremont. It's uh, next door to a wonderful uh, gallery of art. Uh, I think it's Sugar Mint Gallery, uh, Y instead of I in mint. And they really uh, pump up the uh, Michael Myers during this time of, of, of year where you can go and buy memorabilia and random artist work. They also have showings in their uh, backyard. It's a, a house that's been turned into an art gallery. And then next door, they have the Halloween house. And it is, um, ironically today, uh, a, a lawyer's office. Hmm. And so it's, I'm sure it's just as scary for some people to go there today uh, as it was back then in the 70s. And a couple years ago, uh, they had a lot of the remaining uh, cast members uh, come for an event and they and they did a kind of a a, a picture right out in front of that uh, that iconic home. Nice. Dave, if you uh, had a chance, uh, I'm sorry, go right ahead. No, I, I was going to say one of the the cool things, too, is that I had um, I lived also pretty near Sierra Madre and I had no idea that the fog church was in Sierra Madre. And I had not seen the fog until very, very late in life. And just maybe three or four years ago, I saw it for the first time and absolutely loved it. It became one of my favorite horror movies. And I looked up the church and it was just like a, a few you know minutes away. And I, I drove there and took some pictures on the outside. And there was a, a lady cleaning the church. She came out and I was like, can I sneak in there? And, and mm. she's like, yeah, go ahead. And so I had the fog church uh, to myself for about 20 minutes uh, where I could just kind of sit and, and just really enjoy that uh, atmosphere. Very cool. Dave, if you had a chance, would there be any other famous place you'd like to experience? Maybe the Bodega Bay schoolhouse, the Winchester House, or up in uh, Tracy's neck of the woods, Oak Island in Nova Scotia. Yeah, you can get my uh, plane ticket now for Oak Island. I think that would be my favorite location. I am addicted to the series. Uh, I am waiting for season 12 to be released right now. I own all 11 seasons. I remember hearing about Oak Island back uh, again when I was a uh, a young kid listening to, uh, we had a TV show called That's Incredible. Yes. Uh, John Davidson, uh, Fran Tarkenton, yeah. Mary Lee Crosby, Kathy Lee Crosby. Don't remember the, the I girl. I think it was Kathy was, Lee Crosby. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and they went to Oak Island and they told the story of that. And I, uh, I love the story. And especially um, once the series took off, I, I just have really enjoyed the stories and the adventure, and it, it does make you feel like a young kid again, I think, is why. For those who haven't seen that TV series, tell us about it a little bit more. Well, the story goes that way back in time, 1600s, maybe 1700s, there was some treasure buried, perhaps by a you know pirate or some type of fleet from uh, Europe, and these teenagers... Uh, saw some lights on the island and they uh, rode out and they found some of the treasure, but the hole that they dug, which a little unbelievable, it's about 80 feet deep, 90 feet deep, um, filled in with seawater. There were some uh, secret passages that made it, you know, kind of uh, trip and fill up with water and people have been looking for it ever since. Uh, back in the 60s and such, there were many owners of the island and 
a couple of them passed away. I think eight people have died on the island already. And the, the secret is there needs to be one more before the treasure is revealed. And so it's kind of a, a very fun story, but it's it's very historical. And they're at the point now of this series where they're traveling to Portugal and France and other countries to really bring back, um, trying to put together the history of this small island off the coast. Oh, nice. I've actually never been to Oak Island, Dave, which is such a shame. I've been in that neck of the woods, but uh, I've never actually made the visit to the island. So I'll let you know if I actually go. <laughs> I would love that. <laughs> Me, I would love to go to the Winchester house. So maybe we can exchange locations for a summer. <laughs> we could, we could, we could even meet up at the Winchester house. I've never been there. It is uh, one of the homes too, that a lot of my students, now that I'm a teacher, they mm -hmm. write papers on because they're fascinated by it. And the story that it's, you know, just keeps being built on and built on by, you know, of course, Sarah Winchester and uh, to escape all those people who were killed by the Winchester rifle. And it's a, it's a very beautiful home here in California. Oh my gosh. It's, it's definitely on my bucket list. I subscribe to their Facebook page just so I can, you know, look at some of the wonderful pictures and they're starting to gear up for their holiday season for of course, Halloween. So I'll just be jealous I, looking at that for now. <laughs> I would say as far as other locations go, I would love to go to, is it the Stanley Hotel? For the oh, show? yes. I, I think that would be just a, an ultimate e-ticket ride. Mm -hmm. I agree. Absolutely. Um, so let's just quickly touch base on a couple of the books that you had studied in the horror, the horror novel course. Is that the course that you took in college? I did. I did. I did not want to take Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. And I had the opportunity to uh, take the horror novel, ironically, from the Shakespeare teacher. Right. And he was one of my academic heroes. He made, to me, reading fun again as a, a student. He introduced me to all sorts of great authors. And he was someone who was very active in the field too, besides being a, a Shakespearean. He had this great life where he backpacked through Canada and taught in Hong Kong and has a degree from his PhD from Oxford. He was one of these incredible teachers that was just so smart. It's kind of like, why am I even trying? I could never be half as smart as you. And he today works uh, as part of the Ray Bradbury studies. Um, group. And he is uh, among the people who put out the uh, newsletter for uh, Robert Howard, who did Conan. Um, he deals with his estate as well. So he taught this class on the horror novel. And we looked at several novels throughout time. Uh, we started way back uh, just prior to Dracula with a kind of short story uh, called Carmilla. It's about a 60 page novella that a lot, actually quite a few of the Hammer horror movies kind of take on like the I think it's the Brides of Dracula or something along those lines. And it's this incredible uh, story of a female vampire. And it was one that has always stuck with me. Uh, we read Dracula and we read Frankenstein. Uh, and what we would do is we would alternate. We would have two weeks to read the book and we would discuss it. And then the opposite week, we would watch the film or at least one of the incarnations of the film. So for instance, Dracula, we didn't watch the universal one, but we saw the Gary Oldman one. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we would talk about it. We'd have certain games. We'd have, you know, certain of the certain uh, words we would pull out of the uh, text that just aren't used anymore. And we would kind of like help define those. It was just really, uh, he made the class really a lot of fun. Uh, we covered uh, the Doctor of Island of the Island of Doctor Moreau, and uh, talked about all the ideas kind of behind these books with bloodlines and you know playing the the mad scientist and, and all of that. Um, this is where I got into H.P. Lovecraft. I had only seen his books in the 
bookstore and they had kind of these grotesque images of, you know, a meat hook coming through a body. And it that never happens in any of the books. You know, uh, you might have, you know, a picture of in these uh, the 70s Del Rey paperbacks, you would have a skull and a snake would be running through the eyes of the skull. And again, just very um, over the top type of imagery. But the stories became so wonderful and in depth. And there's a few uh, great novels. I, I equate him to Sir Arthur Conan Doyle uh, mm -hmm. writing about Sherlock Holmes. You have three or four novels, but then you have 56 short stories. And with Lovecraft, it is the same thing. He has At the Mountains of Madness, The Case of Charles Dexter Ward, uh, things like that. And then he'd have all his you know 50 to 60 short stories. The people who have written about Sherlock Holmes, like Les Klinger, who uh, does the um, annotated uh, Sherlock Holmes. Uh, he's also written the annotated H.P. Lovecraft. And I think there's very much a correlation between Sherlock Holmes fans as mm -hmm. well as uh, Lovecraft fans. But it was uh, some of the stories are, are great. They're they're scary. A couple of them are funny and comic. Um, I don't know if I care for any of the films that have come out. A lot of them are just very low budget. Um, but, you know, they were essential to having Lovecraft uh, survive as he died in like the 1930s, I want to say. Don't quote me on that. But uh, he's been deceased for a very long time. And unfortunately, like many people, did not see his fame. But uh, even today, the, you know, Library of America publishes one of his not one of his um, they publish a novel of him. With content, which contains two novels and short stories. Uh, mm -hmm. So he is considered a very, very important uh, American author. Oh, wow. You, you've covered a lot of really great novels in that course. And the teacher that you had, it sounds like such an inspiration. It, we definitely need more teachers like him and yourself as well in, in the field, because you're so passionate about like every single topic that you touch on. Well, thank you. You know, you mentioned Frankenstein and Dracula, and, and both I've read. I think Tracy has read them both, and we've talked about them on this program. Mm -hmm. Shame on me, though. I've never read Carmilla. I've heard great things about it. I didn't realize it was only 60 pages long. Tell me a little bit more about that one. Well, you can you can find it online, and it is it is a quick read. It is uh, with two uh, females as the lead characters, and one of them is named uh, Marcala. And so, of course, that's just Carmilla with the letters switched up. Mm -hmm. And she is, spoiler alert, because it is 150 years since that's been written, uh, It is uh, she is a vampire, and she is draining the blood out of this other girl. Uh, who is this young girl who's just come to live in the manor house in the countryside. And of course, uh, the people around her end up creating this party and going to 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 kill Mercala or Carmilla. And I, I do give it two thumbs up. It is a it is a great read. It's a fun read. Uh, I'm not a big rereader, um, but I have reread that story probably about three times and I will probably do it again this season. Nice. And it's by One Joseph, uh, I'm sorry, Joseph Sheridan Lee Fanu is the author of that. And uh, yeah. he has written some other uh, stories. I have one of his uh, books, um, The Purcell Papers. And there, it's he writes some really good books and, and just not a, a known author today. Yeah. One other that you mentioned that I have not read either, although I've seen the various film adaptations, but it's a classic, The Island of Dr. Moreau. Yes. Are We Not Men? I remember that phrase from the from the book consistently. And um, I loved watching the different incarnations of it as well. Um, it was, uh, I think, Burt Lancaster is my favorite uh, actor to play in that film. Um, I'm not sure if I like the last one with Marlon Brando and Val Kilmer, but it was... Uh, you know, still fairly truthful to the book. And it was also kind of uh, unique. H.G. Uh, Wells 
I believe was the author of that. Yes. And of course we have the invisible man and the time machine as uh, some other great books from him. Yeah. Those are some, some great mentions. And I I'm glad that you do that because I think in today's horror world, there's so much focus on the films, the new series coming up on Netflix and sometimes we lose sight of the classic writers. Now, there's a lot of attention to a Stephen King, a little bit lesser so to Dean Koontz. Of course, Anne Rice, uh, up until her passing, was a very, very significant writer. But some of the classic writers from the 1800s, we don't talk about them enough. And I'm glad that you did with us tonight. Yes, thank you so much, well, Dave, listen, we want to thank you for joining us over this past hour. You've covered a lot of topics, and I mean a lot. Uh, growing up as a horror fan, talking about Kolchak, talking about Art Bell, UFO sightings, uh, ghost sightings, favorite films, favorite books. Uh, it's really been a lot of fun. We appreciate your time with us. Well, I've enjoyed being on the podcast and talking to you both. Oh, it's been so much fun, Dave. We could probably do a part two, actually. We should. I want to ask you about Frankenhooker when we do that. And I want to ask you about the Basket Case movies. I hear you're big fans of both of those. I am absolutely a big fan of both. And um, I will hopefully will be able to even talk about Sherlock Holmes a little bit. You yeah. had mentioned uh, Curtis Armstrong on a on a previous program. And some of these books come from his collection. Nice, nice. Our thanks go out to our guest this week, his name, Dave Plouffe, Dave, a lecturer at Cal State Fullerton, uh, co-host numerous programs on the YouTube channel. Check it out, The Late Late Horror Show, and uh, a faithful listener of this program as well. We're most appreciative of that, too. Our thanks to Dave. Thanks also to Tracy as well. We appreciate all of you listening over this past hour. Thank you for joining us in this Museum of the Macabre, and we hope that you'll join us again next time right here in the Ghostly Gallery.